Uh, I've been asked to read, actually, um, uh, the um, introduction by Jeannie Chen. So sort of imagine me 40 years younger. Uh, greetings from South Dakota. We wish I could be, I wish I could be with, be amongst you today to introduce Andrew, Andy Yarrow. I am going to do the be next best thing, a written introduction read by Lynn Hollick. Uh, I have known Andy for about a decade. He has been a gracious host of rich food parties, including one last fall when he introduced his book about Look Magazine. Through his wonderful storytelling, I learned about a magazine that was informative and thought-provoking, but sadly ended circulation in the early 70s. You can tell she's younger than I am, I knew Look Magazine. <laughs> um, it turns out magazines have played a formative role in Andy's life. At age eight, Andy had his own weekly magazine for his family called The Weekly Cat with bylines attributed to the family cats and dogs. I hope you will enjoy the fruits of Andy's research about Look Magazine as much as I did. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about uh, Look today. Um, <clears throat> besides uh, writing a, a magazine when I was eight years old. I um, wrote for the New York Times for a number of years and worked in government and nonprofits and uh, written five other books. And um, I'm now teaching at George Mason University. But uh, today I want to try to give you a, a quick history of Look. Well, many people kind of confuse Look or sort of allied it with Life magazine, its competitor, for many years. Look published for many of the same years as Life. It published from 1937 to 1971, and actually for seven years in the 1960s outsold Life. But in many ways, it was quite a different magazine from Life. Although they were similar in format, they uh, both had great photojournalism. And just to give you the uh, Life history, Life published about six months on either side of Look, so 36 to 72. So it was basically the, a heyday of uh, these mass circulation magazines. But <clears throat> Look was in many ways quite different. Look was um, a bi-weekly, Life was a weekly. As a, a bi-weekly, it did feature stories, Life did news stories, and as a result, doing feature stories, it, its writers spent a lot more time on subjects, did more uh, kind of thematic stories, and since Time was a big corporation, Time uh, Life, Time published Look, uh, Life, and uh, it, um, if you, many of you know, and nothing against time or time life journalism, was much more committee written and edited. And I know some of that, having worked at the New York Times, you're heavily edited, whereas Look was very lightly edited, and its writers had a lot of leeway in what they could write about. And as a result, as one writer uh, told me, <clears throat> its writing ranged from the visionary to the pits of bad taste, whereas life was kind of on an even keel through uh, much of its writing. <clears throat> and, you know, while many people would see these magazines as being kind of middle brow and middle American, and Look did originate in middle America, um, it began in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, the family that published it, uh, published the Des Moines Register, the Coles family. Um, <clears throat> it moved to New York City in 1940, three years after starting. But although um, it has this kind of image, especially in hindsight, being middle brow, middle American, in many ways it was a kind, pretty iconoclastic and radical magazine, particularly in its later years. And as I'll talk about in a couple minutes, there were a couple areas, a number of areas of its coverage which were really quite forward-looking. It was very forward-looking 
on civil rights and racial issues going back to the 1930s. And I'll tell some of the stories of its civil rights coverage in a moment. It was also in the 60s uh, quite upfront about, uh, quite forward looking about the social movements, about uh, kind of new psychology, humanistic psychology, the counterculture, hippies. And uh, I mean, there is um, one of the, the writers who's still alive coined the term and look, the generation gap. Another of the writers who's, who's still living uh, <clears throat> really was uh, respons or one of the main people responsible for luring many young people to the summer of love in San Francisco in 1967 with stories about San Francisco, the Grateful Dead. Uh, he's still kind of an 85-year-old hippie in, in Georgia today, a colorful guy. And Look also did some very powerful foreign coverage, foreign policy coverage and particularly of the Cold War. And um, for example, as I'll talk about a little more in a, in a minute or two, it was the first major magazine to have uh, writer and photographers in communist China, uh, Red China, of course, as it was known in the mid 50s. Uh, it did a lot, it also was very pathbreaking in covering uh, Castro's revolution in Cuba and then the disillusion with the revolution, uh, the Soviet Union as well. But let me um, kind of move forward a little bit. Here are just, um, did I, uh, yeah, a bunch of covers. And so um, you'll see here, the middle uh, image here, Death of, the Pres of a President, William Manchester's book of, about the assassination of JFK was serialized in Look and uh, supposedly read by 70 million people over four issues. And that's one thing I'd like to say at the outset about Look and I talk about in my book. One of the great things about Look and Life as well, which I discuss, is that it was a very different era of journalism. Not only was it a more balanced journalism, a more in-depth journalism, not the kind of you know, uh, shrieking things that we see in the media of the left and right today. But it was also a medium that reached millions and millions of Americans. At its peak, its circulation went over 8 million, uh, which meant a readership of about 35 million. By comparison, Fox News, uh, Tucker Carlson gets only about 4 million viewers today. So, Mass, mass audiences, and what this created, and there's a great phrase uh, that former President Obama used, talking about how America lacks a common conversation today, which I think is very true. You know, regardless of one's politics, we can't really talk to each other. We can't talk to each other even from the same news, the same sources. And one of the things about look in life is that you had people of all types, you know, from uh, work workers to CEOs to uh, people in government um, who, who read Look and who could talk about it, uh, talk about the same stories, creating this kind of proverbial water cooler conversations that have become even more rare with COVID and working from home. But <clears throat> the... Um, this ability to create a common conversation, I think, was a remarkable thing that Look, Life, and to a fair extent, the three networks did. Again, Walter Cronkite at his peak had 30 million viewers, too. And, this, and these were in years when America was much less populous. Uh, in fact, half the population of today back in the 1950s. So um, why did I write this book? Um, as, as I think I mentioned, uh, I'm a historian as well, um, a historian, my PhD is in 20th century American history. I've taught at American University and George Mason and focused on the post-war era. And it, uh, to me, is such a pivotal era. And in many ways, perhaps, you know, growing up at the tail end of that era and growing up at the tail end of the look era, 
Um, I kind of idealized that era, again, for some of these same reasons that Americans were able to get along, and able to get things done. It was a country that was much more optimistic. I don't want to get into politics, but you've all probably seen the recent polls showing 90% saying the country's going in the wrong direction. In the early 60s, you had polls saying just the opposite, 85, 90% things going in the right direction. Um, you know, a little bit about the Paul's family. Um, I'll come back. Oh, here. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the post-war prosperity, I mean, this was an era of tremendous, tremendous prosperity. The United States was growing, and it was a country that was uh, growing together. Um, most Americans were reaping this prosperity. Admittedly, a lot of um, African Americans were shut out, and many others were shut out, but it was an era of hope. It was an era of progress in the country. And, I mean, you see these, these wonderful images looked at uh, uh, annual car issues and these gleaming cars coming off the assembly line and the family in the backyard uh, with their backyard swimming pool with their new, new house. Um, and so I mentioned civil rights. And let me just tell you uh, a little bit about Look's civil rights coverage. Um, the, store, the photo on the left, some of you may recognize, was by a local photographer, James Corrales. And this was uh, taken in the, uh, the last miles of the march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. And many people consider it um, an iconic image of the civil rights movement. The picture on the right, here again, 1952, to give you just a sense of, as I say, the uh, really forward-looking nature of Look's coverage. I mean, a pretty hard-hitting headline, How Far From Slavery, 1952, suggesting that the US really, really had a long, long way to go. Um, and here is an interesting, uh, well, to me interesting <laughs> at least, um, some highlights of, of Look coverage in civil rights. And they did stories on civil rights and on racial issues throughout its, um, its history. But you know, going back to a 1939 story talking about Southern poverty among blacks, uh, Wallace Stegner, the famous novelist, did uh, a piece and look, published a number of books. And there was uh, a book that uh, Stegner published with Look in which he writes, in 1945, at the very end of World War II, that racism is an insidious illness, segregation, the shame of democracy, the slimy propaganda shoveled out by demagogues. Um, and many journalists got their start at Look Magazine. Carl Rowan, a name you may know, um, an African-American journalist in 1952, writing for Look, writing this article, How Far Is America? from slavery. Uh, Look was also one of the first publications to um, hire a full-time black reporter in the 50s, Ernest Dunbar. Uh, it was the first major magazine, uh, mass circulation magazine, to have uh, African-American fashion models in the 1950s. Um, uh, its longtime editor, Dan Misch, quoted here in 1956, in the long history of man's inhumanity to man, racial conflict has produced some of the most horrible examples of brutality. And I'll <clears throat> talk about this William Bradford Huey story in a second. But just quickly, a couple of others, Robert Kennedy. The Kennedys wrote a number of pieces for Look. Look had many famous public intellectuals, politicians writing for it. Uh, a great piece me, based on a sermon uh, Kennedy did in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, suppose God is black. And Edward Brooke, the first black senator since Reconstruction, the Republican senator from Massachusetts, writing in the aftermath of the 67 riots, talking about uh, how black power, the rise of black power, is a, rise, a response to white irresponsibility. Um, 
So um, Look had a long relationship with Jackie Robinson, really introducing him to the American public. Robinson wrote for Look about um, uh, his uh, tremendous difficulties as the first black baseball, major league baseball player. And instead of announcing his retirement at a press conference, Robinson announced his retirement in an article in Look he authored for Look magazine. So the story on the right, this uh, one of the most famous stories Look published after Emmett Till was murdered, the 14-year-old boy murdered in Mississippi in 1955, and whose story, sadly, interestingly, has been back in the news just in recent days. When the murderers were acquitted by an all-white jury, Look had the uh, foresight, the wisdom, uh, or the chutzpah to just uh, send uh, a writer and photographer to go down and interview the murderers. And this story, the shocking story of an approved killing in Mississippi by Southern journalist William Bradford Huey, uh, was published the first of two stories in January of 56. Now, the man in the foreground here was one of the murderers. Um, this is his, his family. And um, have some of you heard the recent news that's brought Emmett Till's killing back into, yeah, so you know about uh, the woman who accused him uh, back then of, of whistling at her or flirting uh, and accused, and this was told in the Look story, uh, uh, was later found or she told uh, a, a historian in the early 21st century that she made it up. The Justice Department reopened the case. She refused to talk to the Justice Department. Uh, now some relatives of Till's descendant, or relatives of the Till's family have tried to prosecute her. She's still alive. And you know this story was brought before the American people in a huge way by Look magazine. And uh, you look at the date. This was just months before the Montgomery bus boycott. Many people credit this story um, in part with the um, uh, 1957 Civil Rights Act that Lyndon Johnson shepherded through Congress as majority leader. Just a couple other civil rights pieces. Um, Another interesting chapter, Norman Rockwell, who for years did covers for the Saturday Evening Post for decades, was not allowed to uh, show African Americans in other than a subservient position in, the, uh, in his images for the Saturday Evening Post. Mike Coles and Dan Mish, the publisher and editor of Look, said, you want to come to Look and do something more hard hitting. He came, he did 30 paintings, Perhaps the most famous is the problem we all live with of the little girl, Ruby Bridges, being escorted by federal marshals to integrate a school in New Orleans in the early 60s. Again, uh, you see the uh, horrible epithet on the wall, a very powerful painting, a painting uh, that Barack Obama had hung uh, outside the Oval, Oval Office for a year when he was president. But they also did stories that, you know, I think uh, it's great in a way how they make fun of this Ku Klux Klansman on the right, looking pretty uh, goofy in his outfit in front of his TV with his sort of goofy looking dressed up uh, uh, lampshade there. Um, but uh, another Rockwell painting, Murder in Mississippi, the murder of the, about the murder of the three civil rights workers. And again, I mean, think of Look reaching overwhelmingly white audience across the spectrum in America. What did this say to Americans? And this was, much of Look's coverage was before you had TV news, or much TV news, or certainly color TV was only coming in in the mid 60s, mid to late 60s. So these images had a tremendous, tremendous impact. Uh, more stories here, just a cover, uh, a special issue, the blacks and whites, Norman Mailer on black power. Uh, again, kind of a goofy story. You'll see Jimi Hendrix, the headline, socks it to the white cats, but whatever. It had to be, as I say, pits of bad taste to the visionary. But <laughs> um, here is, um, they did a lot of stories, as I say, about uh, 
counterculture, about the changing America. Uh, this was John Poppy's story on the generation gap. Uh, the piece on the right, <clears throat> the photo on the right by photographer Art Kane, um, at the beginning of the uh, ecology movement, the environmental movement in 1970. And this was, and I, um, this issue alone, I mean, if you have any interest in Look Magazine, and uh, aside from my book, and want to uh, go uh, onto eBay and try to find it, this issue, the first issue of the 1970s, I think is one of the most remarkable pieces of journalism in American history. It, um, here inside, Gloria Steinem wrote for Look. This was not her first piece for Look. Uh, she wrote Why America Needs a Woman President in 1976, a story paired with William F. Buckley Jr., the uh, great conservative columnist, Why America Needs a Black President in 1980. Of course, none of this happened. But you'll see, I mean, all these other cultural stories. John Poppy, I mentioned William Hedgepeth is the, hep, the hippie. I mentioned George Leonard, quite a, quite a wild guy, why we need uh, new sex, new power. And um, uh, Leonard also introduced America. Uh, I don't know if uh, many of you know the Esalen Retreat Center in California which became kind of a center of humanistic psychology. They did a number of stories on, on Esalen, and uh, Leonard, after Look Folded, went to become a leader at Esalen. And for any of you Mad Men fans out there, you may uh, know or remember the last episode of Mad Men shows um, Don Draper sitting at what appears to be Esalen. And if you look carefully in the episode before, he's holding this issue of Look Magazine. So <laughs> if you go back to that. Um, another story that was quite remarkable, again in 1971, they did a story on a gay couple. Um, and this was, uh, this was a married couple, believe it or not, uh, some whatever, again, get, trying to get my math right, 40 some years before gay marriage became legal in the United States. They were married by a renegade minister in uh, Minnesota. Look, did this sympathetic story. Of course, they got met much outraged mail. And um, while Look's main offices were in New York City, their back offices were in Des Moines. And they got literally you know, thousands of pounds of mail. <laughs> and on um, a story like this, a lot of cancellations. But, Quite remarkable, and this couple, uh, still alive, um, were discovered by the New York Times, my old paper, when gay marriage became le legal, but Look profiled them back in 1971. So yeah, here, I mean, the American family, this is where, um, uh, I mean, the story about, uh, oh gosh, yeah, unwed marriage, uh, they did a lot of uh, stories on, on communes, early stories on uh, interracial marriage. Um, is the family obsolete? I mean, kind of a 1960s trope. But um, again, all of this to kind of dispel your ideas that this was sort of a middle brow, uh, middle of the road magazine politically. Let me just move on to their foreign coverage. And as I say, they were great in their coverage of the Cold War. And I love this juxtaposition on the left. And Look was hardly alone. You know, Uncle Joe Stalin was, you know, the, uh, our ally in World War II. So in 1944, there was an image, which I don't show here, but you see the kind of happy portrait of Stalin on the left, showing him reading poetry to young children. By 1948, after uh, Stalin's brutal and murderous uh, ways had become known, the uh, uh, overrunning of Eastern Europe, uh, Stalin is the brutal dictator, is shown as the brutal dictator he was, um, and yeah, from ally to adversary. Um, the piece on the right, the photo on the right, <clears throat> looked at a couple of stories in which it sent uh, writers and photographers 
along the entire length of the Iron Curtain from, I guess, the Adriatic up to Finland. And um, there were some wonderful, wonderful and powerful stories and photos. Like, and one was right after the Berlin Wall had gone up where um, they show uh, a street in what was West Berlin, a little boy playing, his street was cut off by the wall and you know, he can't play down to the end of the street. I mean, just, just horrible but powerful images of what, uh, what communism, what, what the Cold War was doing. And uh, there were stories, too, of uh, meeting reindeer farmers in Finland whose reindeer wandered into the Soviet Union and they couldn't get their reindeer back and <laughs> the fights they had uh, with Soviet guards. But uh, just very, very powerful stories. As I mentioned, um, they went into uh, uh, what we now call the People's Republic of China, but was then certainly here called Red China. Um, China called itself the People's Republic. But these great images that, um, you know, for what, despite the horrors of Mao's regime, it humanized China, it humanized you know, this was not just a bloody enemy with nuclear weapons. I mean, it was that, but there were little children, poor little children playing on the streets. And Look was very much an internationalist publication. Um, <clears throat> I don't talk about it or I don't show images, but um, the publisher, Gardner Coles, Mike Coles, uh, was, uh, you know, that's rare breed today, a liberal Republican. And one of his biggest heroes was Wendell Wilkie, although he did work for, uh, during the war, actually worked uh, for FDR too, went on a, a fact-finding trip uh, for FDR, and he published people like Hubert Humphrey, Adlai Stevenson, sent Adlai Stevenson around the world for a look after Stevenson lost to Eisenhower. Uh, Wilkie was the... Um, the uh, great proponent of one world and uh, the belief that, you know, there should be, uh, you know, we should try to come together as a world. Uh, Look was like many Americans in the aftermath of World War II, a big proponent of the United Nations, was a big fan of the European coal and steel community, the, which became the EU. And um, again, I mean, thinking about uh, media today that, and think about mass media, what, you know, again, not just uh, intellectuals or, or people in the know in, in Washington or New York or the West Coast read, but people throughout the country. He did stories on Robert Schumann, one of the architects of what became the EU. And, you know, th there were stories, too, about uh, leaders of um, countries, new countries around the world. Many stories on Israel, many stories on India, um, stories on decolonization in Africa uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Look was uh, great in its, uh, well, pathbreaking in its coverage of Cuba, going back to covering um, Castro and his guerrillas uh, before the revolution. Uh, but these images, um, these two, I think, are, are great stories. Uh, Bill Atwood, one of Look's reporters, one of the interviews he did with Castro, after Castro seized power, uh, Castro would only meet him in uh, his airplane, the airplane seized from the former leader, uh, Batista. And so they flew around the Caribbean for four hours, Castro, of course, notoriously being a endless speaker, and hopefully I'm not one today. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, this was where they were able to do their interview. There's a picture on the right, uh, Laura Bergquist, um, a really interesting writer uh, for Look. And Look had a number of uh, women writers, was pretty early in having uh, women reporters and editors. Uh, here interviewing uh, Che Guevara, and in fact, some, many of you may know the uh, famous picture of Che uh, with the cigar in his mouth that's on T-shirts and posters. That was taken for Look magazine by a phot French photographer named Rene Burry. Um, 
with uh, a great image. And a Berquist who also covered JFK at the time, there were stories she told after Kennedy's death that JFK was jealous of her being with Che Guevara, I mean JFK, the notorious womanizer. JFK thinking was uh, Che more charismatic than he was. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, just a few other kind of, again, in its later years, I mean, stories like American militarism. Um, there was a, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stories, of course, during World War II, but after the war uh, on the Holocaust, uh, on the, the search for uh, Nazi war criminals, Eichmann and others, uh, there was one great coup, one of many great coups Look had that I also talk about in my book where um, they contacted Hitler's former personal photographer in the late 50s and convinced the photographer, convinced this person to, this man, to uh, unearth photos that he'd literally buried in Bavaria. And uh, Look paid for them, but they were published in Look. Um, so... And uh, again, you know, some of the uh, images of um, American leaders are, while looks covers their, well, as I emphasize, there is a lot of very serious, wonderful writing inside. Many of its covers were kind of um, fluffy, shall we say. Not these, but fluffy in that, you know, there were a lot of models and actresses and all of this, for better or worse. But... Um, despite the fact that it became a big proponent of feminism in its later years. But here are a couple of, um, a couple of covers of, of world leaders. Again, this was uh, Mike Coles, the publisher with Eleanor Roosevelt, who, uh, again, as a liberal Republican, I mean, he loved Wendell Wilkie, but he loved Eleanor, too, who wrote a lot for, um, for Look. Again, the Kennedys, this famous image by Stanley Tredick, of John Jr. under JFK's desk in the White House was for look. Uh, I sort of love this picture of the Kennedy women on the right um, for look. Um, and uh, in the 50s, uh, I mean, I talk about the optimism of America in the post-war era, and some of that optimism, a lot of it was driven by economic growth, a lot by America's power in the world, and a lot by technology. And, you know, just remarkable stories, I mean, wonderful stories, and I think I maybe cut this off, but the image uh, from, I think, 1953 or 51 of a plane, a purported plane that would one day, very soon, in the early 50s, fly you from to New York to San Francisco in 75 minutes. Well, that didn't happen, but, um, uh, but they also started talking about some of the downsides of computers. And in the 60s, um, while they, uh, there were positive stories about computers and even a story on the potential for computer dating in the mid-1960s, a Harvard and an MIT student developed some program within Harvard and MIT for students to date via some mainframe. But here I thought a great story, which kind of apropos today, the computer data bank, will it kill our freedom back in the mid-1960s? So uh, very prescient about some things. But as I say, lots of celebrities to um, a lot of Marilyn uh, in uh, Look. Um, I remember uh, interviewing the uh, photographer who um, took these shots of Marilyn, who's now in his 80s. He was in his uh, 20s at the time, and became quite a famous photographer. Um, and uh, he thought this was the most remarkable moment of his life, being able to film Marilyn Monroe in, uh, in bed sheets or in sheets. Um, the, and this image of John Lennon, a cover, and look was a little uh, late in covering rock music, but it did come around to it. It uh, was done by uh, Richard Avedon, a colorized image by Richard Avedon, and Look published um, in this issue a poster with all four Beatles, uh, these kind of solarized images of the Beatles, 
They resold it for 35 cents. It's now in the Museum of Modern Arts collection and sold for something like $800,000. So uh, if anyone happened to have those from look in the, <laughs> the late 60s. Um, and then just a few other celebrities here. Um, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, uh, Liz Taylor. And so, um, so that's, that's my book. Um, you know, there were wonderful photographers. Uh, many people got their start at Look, including the young Stanley Kubrick, sold his first photo to Look at age 16 uh, when FDR uh, died in the spring of, uh, in April of uh, 1945. And Kubrick was on staff for Look for si uh, five, six years. Uh, in his late teens, early 20s. And I mentioned some of the other uh, photographers, Corrales, Tredek, Doug Kirkland, who did the uh, Maryland photos. Uh, Paul Fusco uh, did a remarkable series on F um, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy's funeral train, uh, photographing the crowds lined up between New York and Washington. Um, great, great images, lots of great writers. Uh, thank you very much.